Sarah Grace Dye is a visual artist, curator, collector, storyteller and educator. Her art practice is about documenting, recording, collecting and sharing these stories through drawing, paper making and creating artist books. She describes these book structures as perfectly neat little packages in which to collect and explore ideas, the materials and objects existing in a format that can be folded away kept safe and transported easily. Finding herself often working on a tiny scale, this echoes the shrinking of her physical space and mirrors a new chapter in Sarah's life. While her ethos dictates that it's important to waste nothing, Sarah's practice explores the notion that everything has a purpose, an inherent beauty to be examined and discovered. Sarah delights in taking the ordinary and elevating it into something else by giving found materials a new purpose. These pieces with their textural surfaces and misshapen edges are beautiful, elegant and tactile. Embracing the joy and excitement at what might be discovered next, with paper at its base, Sarah explores what we might think of as book and she collects ideas and stories and reinvents them into new forms with deeper meaning. Sarah says, making books is very simply about touch. The feel of different papers and the joy of folding, cutting and collaging together something that makes me smile and my spine tingle. So let's find out more about all these sensations and discoveries as we welcome Sarah, who joins us from her home in Frankfurt as this week's Friday Feature Artist. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Tara. <laughs> and welcome, and welcome everybody from wherever you're joining us from today, this morning, this evening, past or future. And um, we'd love to um, hear where you're from and who you are. And um, I'll just share who's with us today. Um, hi, Tracy Perth. Wow, excellent. I have no idea what time it is in Perth. Monica. So good, everybody, that you can join us. And I'm sure more people are just working out, clicking on the links and everything right now. So that is excellent. Um, yes, keep them coming. So this is my first one back for 2023. I could have changed the set, but, you know, who has time for things like that? <laughs> Can't believe that time has gone fast already. And um, so... In a nutshell, we're going to be talking about paper and books, which is seemingly seem like two very ordinary things, but in your case, I think they're anything but. So I think I first came across your wonderful books on Instagram through the Are You Book Enough hashtag. Um, can you tell us more about what that is and how you got involved? And then I'll show some images from the work that you did. Yeah. Okay. Um, Are You Book Enough is um, an online community on Instagram. Um, set up by um, Sarah in Seattle, um, really just to put out a word each month and then you have that month to respond to that word and make a book. Um, it's for anybody, you know, whether you're a beginner, whether you're a professional, it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I think I discovered them early in 2019 and watched from a distance for quite a while <laughs> and then actually took part from October or November 2019. And then pretty much every month since then, I think I've missed two months since then, I've, I've made a book every month in response to their word. And for me, it's been an amazing um, push for my practice to be yeah. out of my comfort zone, to have to make something within a month. I'm very good with a deadline. I need a deadline. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, it helps. Um, and also sometimes the word is something I've never thought about before. So it also pushes your con concepts and ideas mm. in directions mm. you've never thought about. Mm. So it's been amazing for my, it's really built my practice and strengthened my practice. And, and it's given me a community of yeah. people because everybody is very good at commenting on each other's and encouraging and uplifting. And mm. for me, it's been a really lovely experience that I'm and still so much part I of. only managed to do a few over the last few years or whatever like some of them I guess the words just talk to you immediately and you kind of you know you just get the little fuzzy visual in the head and then it's just a matter of making it other times you have that reaction of oh but I've got nothing for that like I couldn't possibly and yeah. then you kind of go you think the obvious and then you think no I better not do that because everyone will do that 
And there were some really interesting all the interpretations. So, yeah. I mean, this one, was the word actually cap? Yes, the word was cap. That was a recent one. Um, and it, that was one that at the beginning I thought, I've got nothing for this. Um, <laughs> But it's it, because I'm doing it every month, it's always in my head. It's always in the background, even when yeah. I'm thinking I've got nothing for this. And then all of a sudden I thought, I love mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and I suddenly thought that I, I've got a box full of my handmade paper. And I was just looking at it thinking, oh, the edges of that look like the spores of a mushroom. So then suddenly I was like, oh, I could make a mushroom. So... it's four books basically that make up the spores of the mushroom oh and so do they come out of the itself so there's four books that come out um and you can open them and yeah wow that is amazing because i mean i didn't want to you know necessarily ask this in the first literal five minutes but um you know i think there's always inevitably it's going to come up isn't it like what constitutes a book does it have to have pages do they have to have words what do you what's your answer to what constitutes a book um i think almost anything <laughs> that's, that's just maybe a cop-out answer i'm not sure um but for me because my background is sculpture i'm all about shape yeah. and uh, yeah. structure and so for me it i think it has to have a kind of a beginning a middle and an end in some way shape yes. or form. But that could be a scroll, that could be steps, that could be, you know, it can be literally anything. So often it is pages, um, but even the pages can come in different shapes and forms and constructions and open in different ways. Um, so really, I think a book is is whatever your imagination can dream up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. And I've got another one. I mean, I have to go and check my comments in a minute. But um, if you can tell us about this one. So again, the word was margin. Yeah, the word was margin. And again, it was another one that at the beginning of the month, I was thinking, oh, I don't have anything. And then an idea popped in my head. Um, And this was a notebook back from 2020. Um, I got stuck in Germany in the first part of lockdown um, and lost all of my income and was a bit stranded and unsure of what I was doing with my life. Um, So I wrote every day in this day. It's a very tiny little journal that a very dear friend bought for me that's really precious and I'd never used it because it was too nice. (laughs) I just thought, actually, no, I've got it with me. So I just wrote out my thoughts every day. Um, And then I looked at it recently and just thought, it's lovely paper. So I had already shredded it, thinking Mm. I would make it into paper. So I had all the shredded bits and the cover um and then it suddenly came to me that actually this my experience back then I was in the margin I wasn't I, right. I was in Germany I couldn't get to the UK where I was supposed to be but I wasn't official in Germany so I couldn't work and I couldn't get health care so I, I felt like I was completely in the margin between two places so that's kind of how this all then came out and I looked at the pieces of um shredded paper and I thought actually they look like margins They look like the little bit at the edge of your page. Yeah. Um, And then I just played with them and ended up weaving them back together again and putting them back together in a book. Um, And the book bit was from a pair of shoes that I was wearing at that time that had now since fallen to pieces. So I'd cut the buckles off and kept them because I just thought they're quite nice. They might be useful. Um, And then it was the perfect thing to hold the book together. Yeah, that's beautiful. And... Also, I mean, you know, was it kind of cathartic to destroy? I mean, not to destroy, but to um, so that you couldn't go back and read the notes. Yes, you know, definitely. You wanted to buy them because they were kind of um, absolutely you've got a memory of them, but you don't have to keep living them as a reminder. And I think also revisiting something. Um, what would it have been? Two years, at least two years later. Um, and realising how different things are now as well. So that was a really good experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And we were just talking about lots of walks in uh, the pandemic and I was thinking, oh, yeah, the, the shoes had fallen apart during the walk. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> they still kind of uh, fit that time. And then this beautiful one was one that we um, used in the uh, social media to talk about today, which um, obviously the word does seem to be fenced. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about the bits and pieces involved there? Yeah, that... Um... 
that was the, the pieces of wood I've been collecting when I go on my, again, during the pandemic. This is from 2021. Um, and I would walk from my house to, into a park and then down the river and collect bits of wood. Um, and I do love these fallen pieces with the, the lichen on there, so beautiful. Um, so I brought them home and then I realised that actually the colours went beautifully with what I was making in paper at home yes. anyway. So I just sort of, again, my whole practice is about playing and seeing what happens. So I just played with the pieces and ended up with that piece. Yeah. Um, and it is a scroll and rolls up, so in my mind is also a book because it's telling my journey, <laughs> my walks. Yeah. And, and I've just, got the detail there too. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, the thread is so beautiful, that little yeah. exact detail. Yeah. I use gold and silver thread a lot in my work because it just, because it's like that precious, uh, in your lovely introduction you talked about, my work is about elevating the ordinary. And when you add gold thread and silver thread, it's like you're saying you're special to some yeah. ordinary object or ordinary piece of material. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tend to just use it as a bit of a pizzazz. <laughs> the light catches it. But yes, next time I'm going to say the deeper, the deeper meaning is that it's special. I'm going to, I might have to borrow that. Yeah, that's better than just sparkle. Um, and I was going to ask this later, but the, um, so when you mentioned about the colour, had you already used specific um, materials in order to get those beautiful greens and lemons anyway? Yeah, I'd already made that paper before I thought about marrying it with the wood. So it was like a serendipitous thing, really, that I kind of, it's all lying on my desk and I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> this all yes, looks all together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. So we'll get into specifics of um, what works best, dyes and inks later. Um, so this one was uh, frozen, which yes, I mean something I don't actually get to experience in Sydney, but perhaps yes, you can tell us more about that. Yeah, that was uh, again. That was another one that in, initially I thought I really don't know what I'm going to do for this. Um, but at the time I was experimenting with making natural inks from vegetation um, and I'm keeping them in the fridge and and actually they were they're quite out of date ones that were had gone a little bit moldy and I thought well what would happen if I freeze my inks um, so I froze froze my inks in little um, ice cube boxes <laughs> <laughs> and then popped yeah. them out and and filmed them melting um, the piece of paper so this is this is basically they started melting and then everyone again came and <laughs> just ah. to make them move so it that they are simply ice cubes melted um and then wow. blown about um yeah so now, you know i didn't ask you once so i could steal your ideas but you know it's like 35 degrees here at the moment so that would be a perfect weekend project just to just... absolutely and, and it's I love something where I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I like a surprise and a, and a kind yeah. of something where I go through a process and then have this lovely surprise at the end. Um, yeah. So. Sometimes that's a disappointing if you've spent 10 hours working on what the thing might be. <laughs> Even that, I think I always used to tell my students, um, there's no such thing as failure because you've learned something. So even if it's not ended up how you wanted it to and you think it's a disaster, you've learned stuff that you're not going to do again. So actually you can take yeah. it as a win <laughs> because yeah. you've learned stuff. Um, yes. And so you mentioned that. And um, so you have a master's in fine art and taught at Arts University in the UK for many years. And I was going to ask, were there any sort of obvious signposts or turning point moments that led you to what you're doing now? Um. Well, I think when I was um, teaching at the Arts Institute in Bournemouth, um, I learned so much, as much as teaching. I learned tons because um, I was in an environment of amazing tutors who all were experts in all sorts of different fields. So I made sure that I sneaked into lots of yeah. them, learned things as well as teaching the students. And also took on challenges, you know, when somebody would say, can you teach this? And I think, well, I don't really know enough about that but go, no, I can. So go research it, teach it. And then actually I learned stuff too. So really from that experience, 
paper making that's where I first did paper making um and also book binding we I'd done a little bit of book alteration when I did my degree um many years ago but I'd never actually made a book so that was so really I owe a lot <laughs> to being yeah. there for yeah. learning those processes yeah and um yeah, books are something that have always appealed to me too. And I guess beyond just sort of folding and stapling, um, then you get to a point where you kind of go, well, I'll just go to the library or I'll look online and surely, or, you know, I guess lots of people use YouTube. But the book, um, The Art of the Fold, um, yeah. that's a real game changer. And I encourage people that if you're not aware of that, um, yeah, that is an amazing resource because the instructions are really yeah. anyone, including myself, could follow them. Um, it was a bit, sometimes I was frustrated that I couldn't get massive sheets of paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, probably people in the US or the UK or Europe can have access to larger bits of paper. Yeah. Some of those m amazing little books and fold yeah. things really do. Yeah, really I owe a lot to that book because I bought that book in, I don't know, maybe 2018, possibly. I can't remember when it came out, around that time. And then I, I went through it religiously and did every single project in there just as a learning tool for myself so 100% buy that book yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and also it kind of um it clarifies that thing of you don't have to write in the books you know they are becoming like sculptural things and then it's all about coordinating the papers and the colors and the feel and all the fibers and things which is lovely in itself not to worry about actual contents in the traditional right. sense well, everything um, tells a story. The colour you choose tells a story about how you feel that day. <laughs> the materials and the texture tell a story. The smell tells a story. So you can tell a story through every single sense, um, yeah. not just words. Mm. And so these pieces, I'm sure there's a story behind this one because of the title. Yeah. Um, this was also for Are You Book Enough? And the title was Heal. Um, and this was... I've been on a journey for the last 12 years um, of I lost my dad and my brother and my mum all to cancer within a short space of time. Mm. And um, and since then, I've carried mountains of stuff with me that belong to them because it's so hard to let go mm. and to know what to do with it and to honour them, really. Um, mm. So for that one, I made this book that was um, about my parents' wedding. So oh, it's yeah. very well their wedding um the the bits in between are one side is letters that my mum wrote to my dad and the other side is letters my dad wrote to my mum um in the run-up to them getting married and I made it um so it kind of comes out like a celebration string of paper so, mm. can, so it's sort of the the structure is a celebration yeah like in itself um but the contents is all about them and their wedding and um yeah, yeah. so really lovely process to make yeah oh, I'm, that's, that's, I'm so sorry to hear that you had to go all through that in such a condensed period of time as well and you know if, if they had been able to see it they just would have been yeah. touched by that yeah but it's so amazing that you've got that um which again so keepsake is obviously a word that's um yeah. uh, means something to you as well because that's another part of what you actually do um, which we also have to get on to as well. <laughs> and so I have a picture of, we can see a little bit about where you are um, now. Um, and obviously I mentioned before you're in Frankfurt. So you said to me that you're literally yeah. creating on top of the washing machine. <laughs> that is my studio space, my little space on top of the washing machine. That wow. I came back in 2020. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, you had mentioned that you had gone to um, Frankfurt for a family occasion and wasn't planning on being there for five months, but you ended up there for five months. And yeah. uh, so I've got these, uh, and you're talking about um, reusing art materials. So, yeah, these are some of the drawings that you did at that time. Is that right? Yeah, this was the very first thing that I did um, when I got stuck because I know myself um, I need to create every day something um, or else I get miserable. So, um I, I'd got a suitcase for two weeks um, with no materials, really, a, a tiny little sketchbook. Um, but this came about because um, a friend showed me, local to where I now live, um, there's a book exchange, a free book exchange where people put books they don't want anymore. So oh. I went there 
and I got hold of um, two really fat, beautiful Italian architecture magazines, wow. uh, which just had beautiful thick paper. So I just used the paper, painted it white, and then made sketchbooks out of that paper. So that, that sketchbook is made out of the Italian architecture magazine that I found and white paint. And then um, I managed to buy a pot of ink and a, and a dip pen. Um, and I just drew out of every window in the apartment just as a kind of centering thing for myself of like, okay, this is where I am. I'm gonna record where I am. Yeah. Um, and it's a real kind of little window in time. Um, and if anybody's interested on YouTube, all of these drawings, the the actual um, time lapse of the drawings is on YouTube. Oh. So you, you draw them. <laughs> so do people just um, search your name to find that? Your no. Sarah Day's Life of YouTube? Yeah. Um, and, you know, th there was obviously a lot of people sharing the similar experience of having to draw out the window. Um, but my drawings wouldn't have looked like that if I'd drawn <laughs> because of my technical skill but also uh, you know you kind of have that romantic notion of when people look out the window in Europe they have these beautiful scenes like if you've been stuck in Sheffield in Yorkshire I wonder what your window drawings would have been very different very different uh massive big old Victorian city centre buildings and no trees yeah. at all yeah. Mine would just be sort of the fence and the next door neighbour and the kookaburra on the fence and that would be about it really <laughs> Um, so um, I just want to share that, um, yeah, Jill, I'm sure that it's not the only one who was fascinated to hear the, the stories behind the book. So thank you for um, explaining that. So um, I wanted to get to, before I mentioned um, this idea of keepsake and that that is something, um, would you call it a, a, it's not really a side hustle, but it's another part of your the business or your creative practice then. Yeah, it is. It's a business and it's and it's kind of I, I started it as a help for other people, really, because I've been through all this myself and had to deal with it and work out how to navigate loss. Um, and so I just feel like I can help other people now with with that. So and this image that I've got here, is that like a, one of your starting points for the other pro the image that you showed? Yeah. Before? Well, this is this is now my um, well, um, last year i sold my apartment in the uk um and was there for three months just kind of sorting out and organizing and um so i spent that time making books about my family um to reduce what i had even more so this case is now what i have left um and it's just a whole collection of books about my mum my dad my brother um, and actually the one that's in the kind of lid is is my baby book that my mum had started and mm -hmm. I've added to it and <laughs> put lots of things in it. So I've now got this really compact little suitcase with all the wow. me, which is a feeling to be in that position now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing and something that um, definitely is something for us all to aspire to, but what a fantastic idea to condense but have meaning to our lives and so I'm just going to show um, I believe this is the book that you made about your brother yeah 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 this is um he died and he was only 34 um and so the concertina well it's not a concertina really but um the structure behind the photograph of him pulls out and becomes a bit like my parents book it becomes oh. this really long celebration piece of paper that is all just photographs of him and his yeah. life um and then the uh, victorian paper puzzle fold next to that is his birth certificate oh. um, which folds away into a little tiny secret thing um the case was part of my dad's bible cover um that i wanted to reuse that leather in that way um and then there's other sort of bits of paper and things mm -hmm. to so it's just one little package all about him. Mm, yeah, I really love how you definitely get so much out of the word reuse and, and use it in those multiple ways, yeah. So you mentioned the Victorian paper puzzle, and so this is obviously another example of, because I'm familiar with the Turkish map fold, but this <laughs> is the, there's something different, something else I didn't know about folding in a different way. <laughs> This is my favourite thing um, for some time now. Um, and, and another dear friend of mine who's also a book um, maker, 
showed it to me one day and I was like, oh, I love this. <laughs> I have to know how to make this. Um, and I've been making it ever since. Um, and it's the fold comes from Victorian, the Victorian era. And it's, it's about ways of sending letters, secret letters to people. So you would write your letter Ooh. like this, then put your seal on it and it fits in a tiny pocket. So you can slip it to someone else or hide it somewhere. Um, mm. And I also love that whole history behind the fold of yeah. secrets, hiding secrets, looking after precious things. Um, so it fits very well with my work anyway. Um, mm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now I'm just going to see if I can remember how to operate the controls. Um, so um, you've got some little something, show and tells, um, because that would be nice. Yeah. If you show us one of your show and tells and I'll just hopefully make you there we go that's better um now we can see something a bit more detail so um yeah what was that little book that you said that you had the paper one or yeah. the these one yes the paper one yes the paper one this is um a little folder that I made to keep a concertina book in um and I made it, I didn't want to use any glue. This was again in lockdown when I had very little. So I didn't, oh, sorry, get it in the camera. I didn't want to use any glue. So I, I bound it with bits of paper on the side, made little holes and bound it together. Um, but it houses, hang on. It houses um, a book that I started making in 2020 of all of my paper samples. Oh, yes. Paper that I made. And the reason why I love a concertina book is because you can keep adding to it. So <laughs> this is now gone massive. <laughs> this is all the samples of the paper that I've made over the last two and a half years, probably, um, with little notes underneath so I can remember what, what's in it, how it's made, percentages of things. But it's, yeah, and it, it's something, it will keep growing. It will get bigger and bigger. So, yeah. Brilliant. Um, um, just on a note of reusing, this is the back of the first page. This was a piece of paper that I was experimenting making um, paper with red onion skins. Um, and it left this mark while it was drying on the paper. And I was going to throw it away, but then I suddenly thought, oh, actually, that's quite nice. I'm going to use that piece of paper for the back for my book. Um, so yeah. again, and all of these little squares are what I cut out of the envelope to bind it together so then I thought oh, I could use those little squares to spell paper uh, yes anyway, so nothing's wasted. absolutely nothing is wasted yes and so I've got these images here of um or you know yeah I'm, I'm sure lots of people there are just going oh and just their noses started to touch the screen then because they've all just got <laughs> a bit closer for an imaginary sniff for at least a little bit <laughs> more detail so um yeah i mean if you can tell us a bit more about um how you started doing it or what's the main basis that you use or what are your favorite bits of stuff that you like to pulp or put in there um okay um when i started doing it, it i was just using um often the kids homework that they didn't need anymore <laughs> and um whatever was in our recycle bin was coming out so um used printer paper stuff like that um, and then I just started using what was in the kitchen. So um, red onion skins was one of the first things that I used. Um, and I boiled them up just to see what happened and then blended them with paper. Um, I tried, made them on their own and then I blended them with paper and started discovering amazing, um, for me, magical things where when you put red onion skin with the kind of homework and printer paper, it turns it green. So actually red onion skins make that beautiful green color, olive -y kind of green. Um, and then really I just got hooked and I used everything in the kitchen. <laughs> and, um, yeah. um, whatever we were eating, I'd use leftovers. I made paper out of uh, fruit salad that had gone off in the fridge that was uh, banana, um, strawberries and apples. Oh. Um, I've done what else have I done red cabbage paper and that's another one of those magic things that it, it when you mix the red cabbage with the printer paper it goes turquoise and you get these beautiful blues um so it's all about experimenting and just using what was here because it was difficult to go and buy mm. 
anything extra. <laughs> I am getting to Marilyn, your question in a second. Um, but you'd think with the um, fruit salad that it would all be just mush and that there'd actually be no colour. But I guess yes, it's um, it got very pale pink because of the strawberries. But oh. it was a lovely, lovely texture. And it had tiny little, because of the seeds in the strawberries, it's got very tiny little specks in it with the seeds of the strawberries. Oh. Um, and it's a really quite a tough consistency. I think the banana helps hold it together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I better not hog the mic here. So um, Marilyn would like to know what you're using to break down the fibre for paper making. Um, um, usually I soak it overnight. Um, and then I have a soup blender. <laughs> That's all I've got. Again, that this came back from 2020 being in lockdown and not being able to go to the shops. Um, and I and I just literally used a soup soup blender. Um, and I still am now. It works wonderfully well. Um, and also because I'm working on top of the washing machine, which is just behind me, I don't have a massive vat. I'm not making huge sheets. So I, I'm making fairly small amounts at one time. So it, it works beautifully. Yeah. And are you still using like a traditional decal type little thing? Yeah. yeah. You can't yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, um, yes, yeah, people are really loving um, the time that you're spending with us. And yeah, poetry, that is such a beautiful oh. word. And um, just back to your drawings too. Um, yes, uh, that we've certainly had practice doing something every day didn't we um yeah so <laughs> thank you so much everyone we're loving the um comments and questions and if you've got any more i'll keep my eye out here um so yeah so um what do i have so the materials um range from the like you said a whole lot of things the skin turmeric um is there anything that is always your go-to that you just when it comes into the house you're like yes i'm gonna get some gorgeous paper uh, from that. I like avocado skins. <laughs> that makes really nice paper. And I kind of found that, again, it was a slightly by accident because I made avocado ink, which is also lovely. And then, and I made it from the stones and the um, skins together. But then I'd got this pan of boiled stuff and I thought, I can't throw that away. <laughs> I've got to be able to do something. So I tried making paper with the skins and it made this beautiful. It's kind of like a little bit like sandpaper. It's quite rough, but it makes a lovely colour. Um, and especially with that one, I mixed half um, avocado skins with half um, brown packaging paper to enhance the brown kind of texture. Wow. So, um, so I'm, I'm sort of nodding and looking at all the things and then I'm going, hang on. Um, so is it just the colour that's coming from the skins or are we like mortar and pestling up the skin so we've got like a ground? Oh, the skins are actually in there. Um, yeah, so they, they were already boiled because I'd made ink, um, so they were softened a bit already. Um, but then I pulverised them <laughs> with the brown paper. Oh, so you right. actually have little, this is why it's like a bit like sandpaper because you have yeah, yeah. little bits of, this, of the skin in there. Yeah. Um, really tough paper it's it's really good to color because it's nice and strong yeah um sorry you froze a little bit there but that's okay looking gorgeous um the um yeah because i was looking at the word eco dyeing and as i said i was thinking of when you dye something that traditionally then whatever it is is still left in the pot and it just makes the liquid um, and so I've got one. And so I guess we're talking about both things, that sometimes the stuff, yeah. fibres, bits and bobs are in the liquid making the paper and becoming part of the paper. And then other times it looks like you're actually um, dyeing fabrics yeah. and paper as well. That's oh. a more recent thing, the dyeing thing. Um, I am connected with um, a, a lovely lady called Suzanne on um, Instagram who is an eco dyer all the time um and we've had a few zooms and chatted and and she explained to me the process of canning um which is a very eco-friendly way of dyeing so it's a long slow process um oh. so last summer i bottled up these jars um with things from the garden things from my walks um rusty nails i'd found you know these kind of things um you kind of bang them up in into the fabrics um and then can it so you have to boil the jar to seal it 
basically but then you leave it so I did that in July and then only opened them in January um oh, and then, wow. that is then it's like another magical process <laughs> that you open the jars to see what's happened and um so I had um eight jars I think that I bottled up last summer and then oh. the liquid is is also a beautiful kind of it's it's a bit watery for an ink but it makes beautiful washes on things and that um and it and it stays really well the the colors mm -hmm. these beautiful bottles of liquid for drawing for backgrounds yeah. for, and mm. it's a fabric now to mm. use with. well done you for waiting so long gee <laughs> i'd be kind of like peering and like getting the thing and now i've got two questions one is um did the papers not go moldy if you use things such as fruit salad not i have never had anything go moldy i think yeah. one of the keys is once you've made it you need to keep it dry i think it if it got damp it possibly would go moldy um so it's just it's keeping it well afterwards um but yeah no i've never had any you've got like other papers pressed between the papers or do you like you um like I just have a box with them all pressed mm -hmm. together so a box rammed full of pieces of paper but it's kind of safely in a cupboard so it's not getting yeah. any kind of moisture onto it yeah particularly if the washing machine is also a dryer <laughs> yeah <laughs> So it's just, just going logistics. Um, Eva wanted to know if um, you've got any avocado paper around, because I don't know if I've actually got a slide that shows it. Um, no, you don't. It is in, hang on. Um, it is part of the mushroom. <laughs> so oh. This is one of the sections of the mushroom. Uh, let me look. See, this is avocado paper. Where's this? Oh, one? yeah little black bits or dark brown pieces in it so it's got a texture um oh, but yeah. it's mixed with brown packaging so yeah oh um, we love that yeah there you go <laughs> um so the word that often invokes terror paper mache um but with the cap you do you you had some form that you molded the paper when it was in a wet state or something to um i actually I, no i i just molded i folded the paper so it's kind of you can see oh, yeah, yeah. Folds. so i made um a, a strip that two strips that went around the outside and they've all got little pleats in them and then mm. one so that's kind of I do, I do mold paper like that but for this one that that's what i did because i already had this this paper to hand that was already made oh. so, and incidentally this is beetroot paper <laughs> so this is you can see the little flecks of beetroot oh. um, sorry what, what did you say it was beetroot beetroot oh oh ah, yeah. okay and not that we have to get really technical but so was the paper wet or dry when you folded it um dry dry oh. that was all dry when i made that okay cool um yes it is amazing diana we're loving it and um my weekend you know it's just changed to something else entirely um <laughs> uh, so yeah have you do you, i mean you probably don't have time to try painting on them as well or, or with your ink and... um yeah you can well you can seal the paper so i generally i don't because i more often than not i'm folding it and and collaging it and stuff um but you can seal the the edge with gelatine or like just painted it oh. over or you can use um watered down pva works just as well um and then you can use it like any paper really for um but also because i make paper with so many different things that's another sort of test that i do to see when i write on it with ink whether the ink just bleeds straight yeah. into weather and what i found is different materials have different effects so each one is different for what it can what you can do on it afterwards mm. um, but yeah but any of them you can seal them and then yeah. use them as normal mm. and um so while i was getting excited with the forms here if you could tell us about these beautiful well it looks mm. like you've done some inky things on there unless yeah. that was already on the paper in the first place no that is um well, the paper I use a lot for drawing is simply lining paper. Um, and again, that came from, well, I've been using it for a long time with students because it's cheap and you get a big long roll of it. 
Um, but then in lockdown, I managed to get a role. So it kept me going for a long time. Um, and with these, I in the summer, we have a garden, but it's like two miles walk away from where we live. So I would encamp to the garden in the summer with my massive sheets of paper and just mark me. I, I make um, I make tools from what I've got in the garden from twigs and leaves oh, nice. and whatever. Um, and then I draw on the paper, but I, I, because I like to be sculptural with the paper, I draw on both sides. So when I finish one side, I turn it over and I do another drawing, usually with a slightly different colorway on the other side. So then when it's dry, I can fold it and I can curl it and I can make it into things. So those, mm -hmm. those pictures you showed at the bottom is a handmade paper bowl that is cast around a bowl. And then I've stitched strips of these papers together around to, to make the forms. Ah, oh, sorry, you can do that hand movement again because I didn't have you on view when you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so then are they, um, it's not like a scroll thing where it all comes apart like a book. They're in that no, I switched it. It's actually it switched. Off. So it's yeah. lasers. Actually, I can show you one. Hang on. Um, I have one here that has turned into a plant pot. <laughs> Love that. Oh, yes. So, so this is handmade paper at the bottom, um, and then this is the scroll drawing stitched, just folded around and stitched in place. Wow. Oh. And so I didn't think, I didn't quite get the, what the name of that paper was. Like, how thick is it? Um, um, it's lining paper that you put on the wall, wallpaper, basically. Oh, wallpaper. Plain stuff. Um, and you can buy it, I don't know, here, you can buy it in a couple of different thicknesses. So I always buy the thickest one. Yeah. But it's so much wet and scratching and <laughs> because it's meant to last. So it's it's actually great paper. Yeah, brilliant. And I have another different, oh, I just love those raggedy edges. They're so gorgeous. They're, they're mostly all handmade paper. Um, but for, actually, I think the brown paper is, is the avocado paper. Um, oh. Um, but that they're all moulded around bowls and, and then the little bit of green is part of the drawing scroll um, on that one. This is kind of a weird question, but now that we're downsizing, where are you putting all these gorgeous things? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> this, is, this is generally why I make things that are stackable or foldable away. Yeah. So I have, I have part of a wardrobe where I've got my boxes of my work um but everything folds small everything's quite i mean my mushroom this thing this is the biggest thing that i've made right. a long yeah. time. <laughs> everything yeah. else is really quite small and and petite yeah yeah and um so i just wanted to show people this as well could you explain that because that's just so again just tactile and sculptural and lovely gorgeousness yeah, that was from, again, the first lockdown. Um, the book on the top is the skin of a pomelo. So I was eating my pomelo and I, I was pulling off the kind of membrane bit to eat the fruit in the middle, looking at it, thinking, oh, this is so beautiful. <laughs> I need to do something with it. Uh, because the pages do open, but they're just the skins of the pomelo. And then the box underneath it lives in that box. Um, and the box is made from pages of the Italian magazine um, that I was mentioning oh, earlier. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, of course, the beautiful colours just all tie in brilliantly yeah. too. Um, okay, so time is flying by. Now, there is something that I do want to specifically talk about is, the, where's my picture? Um, so if you can tell us about the project, um, again, this idea of um, recycling, reuse, and you've got this fantastic project coming up which involves bits of silk. Yes. So can you tell us what I'm talking about and where they come from and what you're going to do with them? Okay. Um, this paper is made from tiny little scraps of silk from the floor of a carpet workshop in Uzbekistan. <laughs> Um, I have a very old school friend um, who lived in Uzbekistan for many years and set up this workshop for the local women really to earn money um, and they make beautiful very expensive silk carpets um, and he asked me six months ago maybe he, he suddenly said oh can you make paper from silk 
And I was like, well, I don't know, I've never done it before, but I'll give it a go. So he sent, I got packages from Uzbekistan <laughs> of these tiny little bits of silk. Um, and I've started experimenting and had some really lovely, successful things. And I just made some yesterday that I can yes. show. Um, oh, a texture. This is silk, mm. blue and white bits of silk. And it made these, oh, where are we, camera? made these beautiful little bowls. Um, and with with this, it's 80% uh, silk, 20% egg box. So um, when wow. I was talking to him, I was saying, I think I need something with the silk to kind of almost like a glue to hold it together, to keep, keep its shape. Um, and I would probably use homework or printer paper, but I knew that that wasn't necessarily something they had. In, in, um, and I need to make it sustainable for people in Uzbekistan. So he said the most um, uh, biggest waste thing would be egg boxes. So uh, that's what my experiments have been. And I'm going at Easter, I'm going to Uzbekistan to work with the people in the workshop to teach them what I've learned. Um, Brilliant. Making paper with their, with their things, that, their trash really. Um, that hopefully it will in time become another stream of income for them in their workshop. Um, partly because the carpets are like thousands of pounds. Um, so they want another stream of things they can sell to tourists that are affordable, that are small. Yeah. And just yeah. put it. So I'm looking at printmaking onto the paper to make little pictures of local buildings and patterns and things. Oh, uh, brilliant. So stitching it because this this blue stuff that is a lot of silk is is almost like felt. So you can mm. you can stitch it and we can make it into purses, maybe and other things. So so that's my next few weeks is is exploring all of that before I go to wow. pass yeah. on. How how long will you be there for? I'm there for three weeks, but one of those weeks will be the teaching, um, and then I'll be exploring the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, we'll look forward to uh, following your adventures on that. Yeah. Um, hopefully they've got a bit of Wi-Fi that you can post and keep us updated right. on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the full cycle of that, but then also, um, you know, that kind of universe connecting things up that um, they found yeah. you, you found them. and um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, I'm off track here now. Um, now, I do have some other questions, but meanwhile, here's another one of your um, gorgeous pieces with sort of found materials and response to the found. If you could tell us a bit about that one. Yeah, that that was from 2021 as well. Um, the wood that is either end of the book is um, was a, one piece of driftwood that I found on my walk um cut in half to make to then make each end of the book and then just a whole selection of paper inside that i've been making anyway um it is around the same time as the fence book yeah um, it's the same kind of papers um and the book is simply two very long concertinas so you can pull it out massively. Oh, okay um, but then also the like the um semicircle one is just it it's just going around a corner if that makes sense <laughs> Um, yeah yeah wow that is yeah that's fascinating and um i think i've got through all of those ones oh i know the um example of the the colored papers where you were talking this sort of shows more about um yeah um, exactly the playing and experimenting yeah these are um i just was looking on my desk one day and their kitchen roll um, that I use to dab my brushes on when I'm painting um, with watercolours and inks and things. Um, and I just looked, unfolded them one day. I don't know why, but I just did. And just thought, wow, they're just beautiful. They're like paintings in themselves. And I love the marks. And then I realised, because most paper towels are kind of three very, very fine layers of paper kind of squished together. And I could peel them apart and end up with three of each of those um and then i cut them up and then i stitched them together did a coptic stitch on them with some gold thread and oh. they became this little book um and each page of this book is like a painting it's like an abstract colorful painting um yeah. and again it's it was it literally was my paper towels on my desk um yeah yeah, yeah that's <laughs> incredible um so yes um jane 
says she loves that ethos of using the leftover stuff mm -hmm. and and i'm sure the, the the kids come home and go here's stuff for the like they just offer their homework and say here's stuff ready to be <laughs> yeah before you can actually read it they're like here's, here's they your home. right what's for lunch are you making paper or is that our lunch i'm not sure yeah. <laughs> i have to check <laughs> yeah yeah and then yes we're all excited about um that lovely project it sounds amazing um, and also, um, people want to know if you teach workshops, I'm guessing in paper or books or... Yes, I do. Um, I, at the moment, I mostly teach on Zoom because I live in Frankfurt, um, but I have students in America and in the UK. Um, mostly, I organise, it's all um, individually organised, so people get in touch and say, I want to learn how to make paper or books or whatever. And, then I structure it because I very much I like working with the individual. I like that really is exciting to me and building communities and stuff. Yeah. So, um, so I love working either one on one or two or three on one <laughs> with yeah. people. Um, so at the moment, I don't have kind of like a downloadable course for anybody, but I do teach a lot um so just yeah message me and we can organize something mm. and uh, yeah so people can find you on instagram or your website and in case i wasn't making it clear you also have your separate keepsake which yeah. is where you make those beautiful special memory yeah. um yeah. projects that you can be commissioned to yeah. Make. Yeah. you can find that through one of the pages on my um my main website is keepsake so it takes you to that that website so you can yeah find it. yeah yeah. And when I was researching about, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, there was so many titles, you're curator, collector, storyteller, artist, all of these things. And then I got to the point where um, in your previous incarnation, you were a well, you, the nomadic northerner. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and so all these places that you traveled to. Um, so, yeah, were you just collecting paper and stuff? And yeah. the specific question I have relating to that was, do you collect it and then trawl it all back with you or were you compelled to make stuff with it as you went when you were traveling um i do both um <laughs> i went to india in 2019 um and um the people i were with kind of said uh india's a lot cleaner now that you've been <laughs> picked up everything off the floor I literally tickets pieces of paper thrown away flowers yeah. anything I found that just my eyes kind of sparked to I collected um and for that particular project I made um in India I found hundreds and hundreds of matchboxes which really struck me because we don't see them in Europe anymore we don't really yeah. use them boxes um and everyone was different had a different design and it's so I made a library of match boxes so um that if you scroll back in my Instagram you can probably find it um but it, each box has a book in it that is made from a very specific place with the little bits that I found on the floor of that place um and and then it's they're all labeled with the name of the place that it came from oh, um, right so, my alley. um and I take I use sienna type quite a lot um so i prepare paper before i go away often just tiny little pieces um so then i can do a little of a hour or something that i find along my way um and then include that in the book as well yeah sorry your internet just went ah, just as you said i make little what was it what was it that you made <laughs> I made little books in matchboxes um, yep. and I often use sienna type. So I yep. prepare them and, yep. and, and then I put them into the books um, right. and made it so that I've recorded a little leaf or a, yeah. I don't know, some, something natural from the place. Oh, okay. So you're, you're using the photo um, exposure thing to create yeah. the impression as you went on the paper. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Love that. Points for thinking ahead there. Um, yeah, I remember going to Japan and all the what they call the free papers, um, you know, at the cafes and the restaurants and all that. But the free papers were so amazing because it often had been just those beautiful handwritten, you know, Japanese um, uh, language and then um, illustrations, which is great. But then before too long, it's actually heavy when you've amassed a lot of it. <laughs> what seemed like an innocent postcard or ticket or flyer or whatever suddenly becomes a massive wad in the suitcase and you're like, oh, no. 
that's partly why I try and make as I go round. Otherwise, I would be bringing an extra suitcase home every time. Um, yeah. So then you can use a little piece of something, but then get rid of the rest of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Home treasure. Yeah, a suitcase full of stuff that people yeah. are kind of chucking out doesn't seem like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, what are you working on at the moment? Gosh. Um, I am um, mostly the experiments with the silk for the right. silk paper. Yeah. Um, still each month the are you booking off? Um, Ooh, so what's the, what's, yeah. Constellation. <laughs> so that's the word constellation. So at this point, yeah. I've no idea what I'm doing, but I'm sure something will pop in my brain before the end of the month. Um, yeah, so people have got what is it then next week? Um, one more, one more week to um, um yeah. But do I encourage people to follow Are You Book Enough on Instagram and, and then see you and if you scroll back a little bit, there's all the words for this whole year. So you can see oh, you know, what's coming up. Yeah, diarise the ones that speak to you. And also part of that community which seemed lovely was um, and I don't know if this is still the thing that um, when you post it, you then go and select um, is it nine of your other favorites? Yeah. Tell us how that works. Yeah, you do, um, at the end of the month, you um, just go to, because we hashtag are you book enough underscore whatever the word is, so you can go and look at them all, um, and then you choose your favourite nine, that's or the, just the nine that speak to you the most from that month, and then post a grid of those nine. Um, the idea is that you do that each month. I'm very bad at doing that each month, so I tend to, wow, every three months, do three from the last three months. <laughs> um, yeah. and, one time and you can do that in your stories or on your but this is the way that we build the community I guess yeah we big up each other and um celebrate things that connect us together and I've got some very good friends now from doing that for the last three or four years or whatever it is um so I yeah highly recommend it yeah it's kind of like your own little um 10 you know being a curator for 10 minutes because you can kind of um absolutely yeah, which is and nice. It's because everybody has different choices. Everybody is drawn to different things. So it's really nice to see everybody else's choices as well. Mm, mm. Oh, I knew that we'd have so much to talk about and we're kind of running out. But, um, you know, one thing we were going to talk about, which we're not really going to have time to, was that idea of um, creativity generally, you know, like what it means to live creatively, be creative, and you've certainly shown us that that's what you do in spades. Um <laughs> So, but the idea of creating without pressure, like how important is that for you? And do you create create every day or do you, do you have things that you do like just in small amounts of time? Like, you know, oh, I've only got this amount of time, so I'm going to do this or? Yeah, um, I do something every day. Um, sometimes that's a very small thing. Sometimes that's a bigger thing. Um, I... I don't make paper every day, but I have stints where I'll do it for like two weeks solid. And yeah. then I've got this lovely batch of stuff that I can then play with. Um, I I like to draw often. Um, and that can be a tiny little thing in a sketchbook, you know, when I'm out. Yeah. Like it can be simply drawing my mug when I'm out for a cup of tea somewhere <laughs> with somebody. Um and I think that trying to have no pressure is is really important. And I, for me, I work out of play. So play is where I find everything, is where my joy is. Um, yes. And you can't play very easily if you're pressured. So, um, but I find, um, you know, this far, I've been doing this for like, I don't know, 30 years or something. So this far down the line that actually the playing always connects with what you actually have to do. <laughs> it kind of, because you're you, because everything is going on inside of you, your playing ends up being the outworking of, you know, what is important and what, and it comes out in surprising ways. Um, so I'm often thinking, I have to think ahead because things like the die jars have to be set up and left and, you know, it's a long process. Yeah. Um, but then there's lots of immediate things. Drawing is, is so wonderful and immediate and mark making. It's yeah. Just, just great. So. And so <laughs> even, um, you know, because that was going to be another one of the questions, the idea of um, always having an intention and an intention versus intuition and that. Mm -hmm. But it's like even if your only intention is to play, then that uh, is all you need. Indeed. Yeah. You do. Right. 
Indeed. You can feel that I'm winding that up there because that is the perfect note. Yes, to take right. on. yes that idea of playing, that's <laughs> where, where we all want to be aiming for. Well, that has been amazing. Um, thank you so much for showing us all of those things and going further with those questions and like those tips on melting inks and ice and, um, and the avocado skin paper just yeah fascinating um and um yeah so i am now going to work out um, how to exit this and um i'm sure everyone else has had so many people tuning in so thank you everyone from wherever you were for tuning in and i'm sure lots of people will be wanting to catch up over the um uh, next few days so, everybody, if you can continue to um, share your thanks um, to Sarah, that would be great, and I'll pop those up. And, Sarah, if you want to just hang there for a minute and I'll just play our outro, but thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been amazing.